Hey, this is Maria. Just a heads up, this episode contains descriptions of abuse and sexual violence. And the lens can't focus on him because he's moving too fast. This is Elizabeth Burchard talking. Oh, let's see what happens. Lens keeps going in and out of focus. Now it's really going out of focus. <laughs> She's narrating a video shot in the early 1990s at the New Jersey home of a man we'll call George. George is charismatic, engaging. His eyes have a way of focusing on yours with a particular intensity that makes you feel like the most important person in the room. He may be a bit odd, but that's part of his appeal. He's unique. Elizabeth would follow him anywhere and she has for the entirety of her adult life. You see, George runs a cult. Like so many cult leaders before him, he has no formal training, no playbook as such. He just knows, as if by instinct, how to draw people to him and control them once they're there. <laughs> He's got that smile on his face too. Can we go down to At the point Elizabeth shot this video, her spiritual guru is making most of the key decisions in her life for her. That mysterious smile of all knowingness. I'm Maria Konnikova, and this is The Grift stories about con artists and the lives they ruin. We hear about cults in the news all the time. It's been seen on this street corner meeting with a stranger, and now they fear that he is under the control of an alleged cult. He was leading a call saying he would take them on a spaceship. The world's most notorious cults. Crazy religious cults. Insane cults. Cults. Cult. Cults. Cult. The 18 men and 21 women whose bodies were found last night just north of San Diego may well... New Age cults, doomsday cults, suicide cults. Some are tiny. Some are huge and blur the line between organized religion and something much more ominous. But I'm here to argue that cults and cons, they're not all that different when you get down to the operational details. Elizabeth wound up in a cult you've probably never heard of. But her experience shows that getting roped into this kind of con is not nearly as exotic as you might think. Elizabeth grew up in the 1970s on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Her family was upper middle class, educated, white, and her parents were divorced. Her father, a psychologist and professor, was kind and thoughtful. Her mother, on the other hand, was quite emotionally abusive. Elizabeth's main joy came on the weekends, which she spent with her dad. But when Elizabeth was 11 years old, her father died. It was sudden, and she was devastated. And felt like he had abandoned me to the enemy, because now I didn't have those weekend breaks with him. But her father left her with two things, a sizable inheritance and an ambition. I planned to be like my father. And I was going to be a pre-med, psychiatrist, go to medical school, and I did well in school. I went to Bronx High School of Science. I mean, I, I was, I was going to work for that dream. I did work for that dream. In 1977, Elizabeth went to Swarthmore College to study biochemistry. Like many freshmen, she did not have an easy transition to college life. She became depressed and anxious. She gained the freshman 20. Now, Elizabeth's mother was something of a self-improvement junkie. She went from fad to fad on her quest for perfection. Her latest obsession was biofeedback therapy for stress reduction. Here's how it works. Electrodes are placed on your body to measure things like heart rate, breathing, and muscle tension. And all of that data is conveyed on a screen for you to watch. The idea is, if you can observe how your thoughts affect your physiology, this awareness can be used to reduce stress. Biofeedback therapy has been used to treat everything from depression to addiction to ADHD. But it's far from a miracle cure. In fact, whether it has 
any effect beyond a possible placebo is questionable. But Elizabeth's mother was a believer. So when Elizabeth came home for Thanksgiving break, her mother scheduled an appointment with a psychiatrist who had a biofeedback practice. And so he asked me why, you know, what's going on, what's bothering you? And I told him uh, the weight and the depression and being away at school. And the weight thing was like a huge thing for me. I, I hated my body. So I'm telling him how much I hate my body, and I have tears in my eyes because it's just so painful for me. So the door cracks open, and this head peeks in, and it's this man, George, who's been listening outside the door, I guess because he's waiting for me to be finished so he could put me on the machine. George was the biofeedback technician. To be clear, he was not a psychologist and had no therapy credentials. He hadn't even graduated from college. All he was qualified to do was run a biofeedback machine. So he hooks Elizabeth up to the machine to begin the session. She's left alone with her thoughts. According to proper procedure, when half an hour passes, George is supposed to unhook her and finish the session. But that's not what happens. Instead, he comes into the room and begins talking to her. He starts to tell me what the problem is with everybody that nobody realizes. And it has to do with the social program. You gotta get past the social program in order to access your brain, because your brain has untapped capacity. According to science, says George, we only use 3% of our brains. That, by the way, is patently false. George's grasp of science is about as shoddy as the science behind the biofeedback therapy. But remember, George has been eavesdropping on Elizabeth's sessions with the psychiatrist, so he knows about her interests and her insecurities. He knows she wanted to go to medical school and become a psychiatrist, so he uses pop psychology terms to appeal to her. And that 3% or whatever percentage you want to sub in, it's quite the pervasive pop psychology myth. George says he can see that Elizabeth personally has exceptional potential. You seem like you're really intelligent and you want to do big things in your life. He was absolutely right. I was idealistic as most kids are my age, who on their way to college and dreaming about their big future. But first, George tells Elizabeth, she needs to access her potential. And if she continues these sessions, he will teach her how to do that, one step at a time. Elizabeth is in a safe space. It's a psychiatrist's office. Everyone goes to the shrink to talk about themselves. You let down your guard. That's what they're there for. And George seems to be doing what a therapist should. He is making her feel good about herself. She came in feeling depressed and insecure, and George made her feel better, stronger, more confident. The future seems brighter. With George's help, she can be her best self, and together, they can make the world a better place. George speaks with such kindness, such conviction. He even reminds her a little of her father. And he just made me feel really excited, and. I never had a role model. To an outsider, cult beliefs may seem crazy. But when you're on the inside, they all make sense. It becomes plausible that the world is ending, that an enlightened alien or a giant rhinoceros or what have you is somehow a savior. Because it never starts out that way. It starts out far more softly, with love and hope. By the time the psychological torture, the emotional and physical abuse, the exploitation take hold, you are too far in to notice. You have become a true believer. Yes, it may sound crazy, but here's what I urge you to remember. We all have that need to believe in something, and most anyone can be susceptible. You just have to meet the wrong person at the right time. David Sullivan was an anthropologist turned private investigator who spent 20 years infiltrating cults in order to help members get out of the groups and back into the real world. 
Sullivan died in 2013, but he gave a lecture on his professional experiences, which was recorded at the Commonwealth Club in 2010. And here's what he would say over and over to all of those doubters who said, that would never happen to me. Nobody joins a cult. They join a group that's going to promote peace and freedom throughout the world, or they're going to save animals, or they're going to further education or help orphans or something. But nobody joins a cult because the cults don't let you know what you're in for. Remember that. Nobody knowingly joins a cult. Elizabeth Burchard certainly didn't back in 1977. She left the therapy session with George in a buoyant mood. She went straight over to meet her boyfriend. She had a boyfriend at the time, Joe. And she told him all about her session and about George. Oh, my God, this guy is so amazing. He said such amazing things. You have got to meet him. You have got to schedule a session with him. And my boyfriend ended up doing that. When Elizabeth went back to Swarthmore after Thanksgiving, she also told a couple of friends about George. She talked him up so much that pretty soon they were curious about him, too. Christmas break came around. Elizabeth went home to New York, and her mother scheduled more biofeedback therapy sessions for her. Throughout the winter break, she went twice a week. That's when the sessions got a bit more personal. And then he starts coming to our house. How does that happen? (laughs) Because my mother and I were lonely. So he invited himself over one day and made an excuse that this would be a new experience. Remember, George was all about new experiences and cutting past social boundaries. This was the first step to maximizing your potential. Seek out new experiences that are uncomfortable and sit through them. And then you will shed your social training or your inhibitions, and then you'll be a bigger person, and that will activate more of your brain. George's visit would break one of those social barriers. They were, after all, patients at the therapy clinic where George worked. Again, just to be clear, George was not a qualified therapist. He was only a biofeedback technician. Even so, spending time together outside of therapy was extremely inappropriate. So then he comes to the house. My mother's all excited. She's making him hamburgers. He's sitting in our living room, you know. And then he's just, like, chatting with us. And it feels like family. It starts to feel like family. George seemed to fit perfectly in their lives. For Elizabeth, he slipped right into the void her father left behind. She came to depend on George's emotional support. And that dependence would only increase. Because a few weeks later, she got a call. Her boyfriend, Joe, had died. He was hit by a train. And he wasn't suicidal. There was just no reason. He was walking next to the train tracks, and it came from behind him. So that was it. That just knocked me right over. Elizabeth was devastated. Joe had died and abandoned her, just as her father had done years before. It was trauma on top of trauma. Elizabeth's mother scheduled an emergency session for her with George. Surely he would help her in this difficult time. And George was completely indifferent. And I expected him to hug me, maybe, show some sympathy, empathy, anything. And he was just like, well, that's over. It's time to move on. It would seem like this would be a red flag. Someone who is supposed to support you is instead kicking you when you're down. You'd think that would be that, the end of the relationship. But that's not how it works. When you're feeling down, depressed, downright rotten, and the person you've come to trust and turn to for support becomes nasty, you don't run. You think you somehow deserve it, that it serves you right. You feel so small and miserable and alone and traumatized that you often cling to your abuser. It's how most any abusive relationship works and keeps working. And that's what happens to Elizabeth. She clings to George even more. 
While she's in New York after Joe's death, she continues to see George for therapy sessions. And George takes the opportunity of her emotional vulnerability to escalate things one step further. I just became completely dependent on him. I, I was like a rag doll. Her boyfriend is dead. And instead of comforting her, George insists she needs to start breaking social barriers. And he breaks down those barriers gradually, one uncomfortable experience at a time. Well, he said to me, why don't you take off your shirt and sit there without your shirt on? After all, if you go to Europe, women walk around on the beach bare-chested. It's no big deal. Americans are uptight about their body. The body is natural. We need to break the social training, sit through the uncomfortableness until it breaks and you'll be comfortable in your own skin. That was the shtick. Kind of makes sense, except not appropriate in a therapist's office. Not appropriate if I'm uncomfortable. And then he would say, well, how would you feel if I sat here naked? So then that was the next barrier to break, is him sitting there naked. And then he pushed it further. At the time, Elizabeth thought of this as consensual sex. Now she doesn't. But there was another factor in all of this. My mother also had sex with him, so she wasn't going to put a stop to it. Um, and she wasn't even going to tell me this is wrong. When George began having sex with Elizabeth, he'd already been carrying on a sexual relationship with her mother. And by the way, George also had a wife and two kids. But Elizabeth was so vulnerable, and her mother was so taken with George. Even more than that, they really just wanted to make him happy. And they were happy to get any small bit of affection or attention that he was willing to give them. Not long after, another patient at the biofeedback therapy clinic complained about George's inappropriate behavior. The psychiatrist fired him. But no matter, George was on to something bigger than biofeedback therapy. He was going to help people unlock their true potential. He would conduct sessions, teach people about the social boundaries that were holding them back. He would provide spiritual enlightenment for a small fee of $40 an hour. Elizabeth's mother generously offered him Elizabeth's bedroom as an office space, rent-free, of course. And they were still paying him his hourly rate. So he took five clients with him who he had brainwashed, my mother and I and three other women, and he started a group at our apartment on Wednesday nights. And he asked us to find other people, bring people in. This is going to be big. We have this, we have this energy. We're going to progress and be amazing and find other people. They got to know about this. They called themselves the group. The original members brought in more members. Elizabeth's last outside link was cut. She no longer had a boyfriend. Her only parent was part of George's group. And now, even when she was off at college, she was connected to George and his spiritual mission. She and her friends talked about it all the time. George and his mode of thinking permeated every facet of Elizabeth's life. David Sullivan, the cult infiltrator you heard earlier in the show, said the process is similar in many cults. All that message is reaffirm, reaffirm, reaffirm. Everything you believe is wrong. They'll create this Orwellian language where every time you try to say something, like in the group I was in, you can't say, I think. If you say, well, but I think that, they go, you think? You think? As George's cult, the group, became more insular, it too developed its own vernacular, its own culture based on George's ideas and rules. This was when things got weirder. How much weirder? We'll find out after the break. Back to our story about Elizabeth Burchard and her experience in a cult called The Group. It was around 1980, when Elizabeth was a junior in college, that George started his head shaking. 
He showed it to me and my mother first, or so he said, so that made us feel special. By now, George was operating out of his home in New Jersey, where his devotees would attend sessions. George told them that one day, while meditating, his head just started moving from side to side, all by itself. He said it was a supernatural power that caused it. And when he did that, he, quote, felt energy, a special energy, an energy that was alive and intelligent. And this energy was going to make our brains alive and bring us to that full potential. Our intellect speaks in a contraction. All our diseases are based on a contraction. The universe and ourselves and our life is expanding continuously. Elizabeth, her mother, and the other followers were fascinated. If we learn how to feel what we're made of, But think about it, hypnotism, what are you looking at? A watch moving back and forth. What's the difference between staring at a guy moving his head back and forth? And the lens can't focus on him because he's moving too fast. You would become hypnotized while you're watching him. And after a while, you just hypnotize yourself. There's a switch in your brain that gets developed, and you just go there automatically. It isn't quite as simple as a switch in your brain. But this is a form of mind control. And the way cult leaders affect mind control is by subjecting their followers to incredibly long, tedious activities. Jennifer Stalvey was a cult infiltrator who worked with David Sullivan. She would join cults and pretend to be a true believer, learning their language, their methods, their beliefs, all with the end goal of getting their members out. Stalvey told me she'd often spend 16 hours a day participating in occult's activities, which included a lot of meditation, some lectures, and not much else. You know, I would go in for early morning meditation, you're on your knees, you're praying, then you might cook together and eat, sit down and talk, and then you've got a class or a workshop, and then you might go back to praying again. I mean, it's, it's a full schedule, and all of these groups are highly structured at least the successful ones are, and that's how they work. You don't have a moment to yourself to um, think. That's one of the techniques, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, you know, lack of fresh air, monotony of terms and sounds, and all of it cumulatively was really difficult to endure. I mean, it's meant to be routine. But even as Elizabeth and the other group members were made to endure hours of lectures and meditation, they believed they were benefiting. Being in the group, watching George shake his head back and forth to generate energy, and sharing that energy with him, it felt special. They felt like they were part of something important that would change the world. But also, it felt like a loving family, just as Elizabeth had always wanted except for the times George lashed out at his followers, which was often. And you never knew who he was going to choose as a scapegoat, and he'd make up some invented crime that they did. It might be something like, I know you have bad thoughts. You're resisting. That was a big one. You're resisting the energy. Well, what does that mean? How can you prove it? You can't. It's, it's, it's fantasy. But that was his excuse then to attack that person, and the rest of the group would attack the person with him. This is one of the tactics that cult leaders use to manipulate followers. First, the leader builds up the follower, gives her hope, makes her feel like she's a part of something bigger than herself. Then he begins to tear her down. It's like what George did on a smaller scale when Elizabeth lost her boyfriend. And if a cult member makes it through the abuse, she comes out on the other end weaker and more dependent than ever. David Sullivan, the cult infiltrator, described a very disturbing scene in one of the groups he investigated. In that cult, one member would stand in front of the room and everyone else would fling insults at her all at once. Then she'd return to the group and they would all tear down the next member. Every single person is subjected to to absolute debasement. You are screamed at, the people inches from your face, you you feel their breath, you feel their spit hitting you, 
So I, I can't, I'll leave out all the profanity, but basically it's like, you are scum. So you picture this woman, who's about 22, 23 years old, physically shaking, her head going down, and then she quietly starts vomiting down the front of her dress, black dress, because she can't speak anymore, and she's beyond tears, and she looks on the verge of collapse. And we keep that up for about 20 minutes until she's, she's just destroyed psychologically. As a curiosity, she became the most fanatically loyal to the leader, was slavishly loyal to him, would actually sit on the floor as close as she could to him to the point where he had to kind of like boot her away sometimes. In her own cult, Elizabeth wasn't undergoing anything quite that extreme, but she does now see many parallels between the way George ran the group and domestic abuse. You get a red flag, but you're so thrilled with this person. You have such a need for them. They've love-bombed you. You get a red flag. You don't like it. You push it down. You suppress it because you're still remembering the good stuff. In both domestic abuse and cult situations, the abuser is alternately supportive and cruel, sweet and vicious. When the relationship is good, it's really good. And when it's bad, it's almost but not quite unbearable. But the difference is that in a cult, there's a whole group of people, other victims, reinforcing the lies that the abuser is telling them. When Elizabeth graduated from Swarthmore with a degree in biochemistry, she planned to go to medical school. But med school is far more demanding than college. She would have had even less time to spend with the group. She might have ended up at a university even further away from New York City. And George didn't want that. So eventually he talked me out of going to medical school. All doctors are fools. Nobody knows anything out there. They don't have the truth because they're all programmed. And you hear that over and over and over and over and over, and you don't hear anything else, you believe it. By this point, Elizabeth had become so emotionally dependent on George, she wasn't making any decisions for herself. He was calling all the shots. And he would take away everything she was interested in and replace it with his own ideology. Here's David Sullivan again. No matter what you used to like, if you used to love flowers or photography or whatever, that'll be out of there. You won't be doing that anymore. Even if you're an artist, even if they could make money off you as an artist, you won't be doing art anymore. You'll be doing something else. And then they'll put forth a closed sense of logic and allow no real input or criticism. And through repetition, they'll, they'll start this closed circuit of logic, which allows no way out. And that is how Elizabeth gave up her lifelong dream of becoming a psychiatrist. Of course, she still needed to make money to pay for her sessions with George, so she taught high school chemistry. And by the way, George's disdain for the medical profession it wasn't just something he said to keep Elizabeth out of med school. He actually forbade his followers from seeking medical treatment and buying health insurance. That's another common tactic in cults, because doctors are trained to see signs of abuse. And you can't have that. Of course, that didn't apply to George and his family, who naturally had medical benefits. Over the next couple of years, the group grew to over a dozen women and one man. All of them believed in George's wisdom and supernatural ability to generate energy by shaking his head. And the more George's power over them grew, the more he became manipulative, abusive, and violent. George had like three black belts, and he was six feet, and he would go into a demonic rage his eyes might as well have turned red. I mean, that's how evil he would become. And he, it, normally he was like, he had this little boy sweetness, I called it. He was it was soft-spoken, and he was so caressing with his voice, and he had a little glint in his eye and confidence, and he wasn't bad looking. He was in his mid-30s, and we were all in love with him. But if he got triggered... He became Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, and he was scary. 
because you felt like you didn't know what he was capable of. I mean, he slammed me against the wall once and a couple of paintings fell off the wall. And then he told me I had to pay for them to be reframed. The glass broke because that was my fault. And here was the kicker, the final step in George's agenda, and ultimately the final reason why his followers could put up with so much for so long. He was the only thing standing between them and death. Somewhere along the line, George, like many cult and religious leaders before him, had realized that the most powerful weapon of all was the doomsday scenario. If you remain in my group, you are safe. But if you leave, you will die, along with all of the other heretics, when the day of reckoning comes. He would say, I'm, I'm feeling, it's coming, it's coming. There's going to be a huge spiritual change and a, a, an energy change, and it's going to affect everybody. He says, because people really are walking around, and they're socially programmed, so they're behaving themselves for the most part in society. But right underneath that shell is tremendous hostility. And when this change comes, all that hostility is going to be released. All the shells of social programming are just going to dissolve. And you're going to have rioting and murdering. And people are just going to be crazy. And the only protection you're going to have from that is this energy. This energy that George generated by shaking his head back and forth was the only thing that could save them from the hordes of violent lunatics who would soon take over the world. And if they left the group, George said, they would get sick and die. Things only got stranger. It was around that time that George's dog died. Soon after, George went for a walk along the beach, picked up a pebble, and had an epiphany. The dog's soul was in the rock. George would use his spiritual energy to resurrect the dog. So he digs up the dog in the backyard and brings it into the house. Thing is, his wife doesn't know that any of this is going on. So he's got this air spray. He's constantly spraying air spray because the carcass stunk. And he managed with his kids to hide the carcass from his wife. It would stay in the garage at night. George kept the dog's body on a wooden board for easy transportation. So now we're paying him to watch him sit with this board on his lap, with this rotting carcass on the board, while he's either holding the rock in his hand or sometimes he put it in his mouth. It was a small rock and shake his head vigorously to get the soul out of the rock and back into the dog. And that was when I really couldn't participate anymore. I mean, I sat there, but people were seeing hair growing. They were seeing the dog levitating. I, it was all power of suggestion. These cult members were college-educated people. But at this point, they were so far gone that no amount of education could trump their convictions, no matter how outlandish. So I called it the religion of the black dog because that's what it became. And there were icons in the, in the room. People brought in little mugs with black Labradors on them. And the den was filled with black Labradors. So I felt like it was a church. And still... Elizabeth stayed. How is that even possible? Well, she was in her mid-30s. She'd spent her entire adult life with the group, and she didn't have anybody outside of the group to support her and help her leave. And then Elizabeth made a friend, Judith Carlone, whom she met as a volunteer for Ross Perot. The American people are good. And yet, over time, we have created a government that's a mess. I'm not kidding. Ross Perot, the Texas billionaire who ran for president on a third-party ticket in 1992. I know that sounds completely bizarre, but it's actually not unusual for cult leaders and other con artists to get into politics. George had volunteered his entire group for Perot's presidential campaign. And they certainly made an impression. George would sit in the back of local town meetings 
violently shaking his head. Can you imagine? Perot's presidential campaign failed, but the grassroots movement remained active. In 1994, Judith was working as an organizer in that movement, and that's how she came across Elizabeth, George, and the rest. From the first, Judith felt there was something off. We all seemed to have the same ideas, and we talked the same, and we had the same jargon, and we were vacant. She also noticed that I seemed really miserable. Like, she felt like I was just sick in my soul. Judith went to a couple of group meetings to find out if her suspicions were correct. And then she saw the worship. You know, women sitting at his feet, looking up at him. And it made her nauseated. And it also really confirmed that there was something very wrong. And then she started to ask me and eventually found out about all the money I was giving him and the sex. And then there was the dead dog. Judith had seen enough. She was determined to help Elizabeth find her way out of the cult. What she did was we became friends, like best friends. And so we would go to Barnes & Noble and have coffee and go to movies. I'd go to her house. And she was feeding me because I wasn't eating. Over these meals, Judith started gently pointing out George's hypocrisy. Like he wouldn't let us have health insurance, but he had it. He poo-pooed us taking our animals to the vet because they don't know what they're doing, but he took his dog to the vet. Judith challenged more and more of George's philosophy and rules. She was asking me, when's graduation? Which was a heck of a question to ask because I was like, uh... You know, she said, you're paying for this service. When is it done with? So... You know, she was like forcing me to look at it from a different perspective. She was shifting my paradigm. And the reason I responded to her was because she was nice to me. Nice. Judith was the first real friend Elizabeth had had in decades. But it still took another three years before Elizabeth finally left the cult. During that time, George tried to keep her in the fold and away from Judith, mostly by abusing Elizabeth even more than before. And it might have worked if it weren't for one thing. Elizabeth ran out of money. In 1997, her financial situation became so dire, she nearly filed for bankruptcy. So George simply kicked her out of the group. I had to cut down my hours because I was running out of money. And when I told him that, he was very angry, and that's what triggered him to throw me out. George said she had to leave because of her friendship with Judith. But really, he just didn't need her anymore. Elizabeth was 17 when she first met George. Now she was 37 and had to learn to live in the world again, or really for the first time. There's culture shock when you leave a group you because you don't know how the world works. I mean, you're in the world physically, but you're not. And I had to learn about things that people know automatically, like personal boundaries. And it took me a long time to get social skills. I just don't know how to be. Judy used to say, well, you're like an alien. You're weird. Your behavior is weird. And she didn't say it critically. She, she was very fond of me. But I, I was like just this strange person because I was programmed by this delusional megalomaniac. A few years after Elizabeth left the cult, her mother was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. She'd been in pain because of the tumor for years, but George wouldn't let her see a doctor. She died in 2005. George died in 2006, and the group finally dispersed. Today, Elizabeth is being treated by a legitimate therapist. She has found support with a group of other cult survivors. Elizabeth and Judith even wrote a book about their experiences. And last year, at 56 years old, Elizabeth earned her Master of Social Work at Fordham University. She plans to help victims of emotional abuse like her.
As for charismatic leaders, she knows there's room in this world for those kinds of people, whether in religion or politics, but it's incumbent on all of us to never stop asking questions. Groups and individuals who want to manipulate you figure out how to, how to get you to suspend your critical thinking and hand over your power to them. Just step back and make sure it is real and not a grand act with a hidden agenda. But that's easier said than done. Remember always David Sullivan's message. Nobody ever sets out to join a cult. People set out on a mission to better the world and themselves. Who doesn't want that? This is the uncomfortable truth about all of the best con artists. They con you without your knowledge. It's so easy to be objective and judgmental about other people. It's so tough to be objective when it comes to yourself and your own ambitions. So before we jump to judge the Elizabeths of the world, we do well to know this. The true power of the grifter is the power we hand over ourselves, the power of belief. The Grift is produced by Odelia Rubin, Shoshi Shmulevitz, and Jacob Smith. Our editor is Julia Barton, and our fact checker is Jen Schwartz. Ben Levin composed our music. Special thanks to the Panoply management team, Mia Lobel, Laura Mayer, and Andy Bowers. The Panna app has hours and hours of great ad-free audio for kids. Try the Pinna app for free. For more information, go to pinna.fm slash listen.